This week, we have another fun coaching call for you. And we're talking to Rebecca, who is a secondary librarian. She just started her TPT store early this year. I'm so excited for you guys to have a listen to this conversation because I think it perfectly represents a lot of what new sellers go through or even intermediate sellers go through when trying to build their store while also balancing working full-time and being a mom full-time and maybe not being able to do things exactly the way that you would love to do them in your business in order to meet your goals. And so we're going to be talking about ways that she can balance and tweak her operations for her business in order to still serve her students in her classroom with her resources and meet her current needs. All right. I want you guys to meet Rebecca. Hey, Rebecca, how are you? Hi, I'm good. (laughs) Good. I'm so excited to chat with you today. When we did this form, the application to be on the podcast and do one of these coaching calls, one of the reasons why your application stuck out to me was that you started just this year. So we're recording this in November. You started in April. So you've been going for about seven months. I have. Yeah. It's been a whirlwind. Yeah. So I'm so excited to chat with you because you're brand new, but I'm really excited to hear about what your visions are for your business in 2024, some of the things that you want to work towards. I think it's going to be a really helpful episode for a lot of people who are listening who are still at that beginning stage of their business. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, anything I can glean from this is just icing on the cake. And anyone who, like me, is brand new can take something from this. I know we can all use the help right now. So definitely, I'm really excited. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about you, how you got started on TPT and what your niche is. So I've been a teacher for 18 years. The majority of my time was in the classroom for 12 years. And then the last six, I have made the transition into the library. And I'm currently a middle school librarian. I have been for three years. And before that, I was an elementary librarian for three years. I am in Texas, so it's a lot going on right now in that world. But I love it. It's great. And I started TPT in April of this past year just because with inflation and I have two very little girls at home, it just got to be a lot, as I'm sure everybody else knows right now. And so I was looking for a way to help like my family and see if we can make this a thing. But then also I really enjoy teaching. Like it's my passion and I love it. And in the library, it's hard, really hard to find good lessons, especially stuff that's ready made because we don't necessarily have a set curriculum. We have standards and we do a lot of collaboration, but in terms of finding quality lessons that are done and activities that you can just plug and go, it doesn't always exist, especially at the secondary level. And so that's where my niche comes in is I knew I wanted to do libraries and reading because prior to being in the library, I was a reading teacher. And I saw that there weren't a lot of secondary librarian resources. So that's when I decided, okay, let me give this a try. This is something I can do. I know I can do well. My lessons are good. They're quality. They're fun, which is something that I really try to promote with my students and like other librarians in my district is let's just have fun in the library. So you've got kind of a unique niche, but meeting a really unique need in the market for secondary librarians, which I love. I also heard you say you're in Texas, which I'm also in Texas. And I know that, (laughs) you know, I know there are other states that are experiencing some really similar things in the book world and in the literature community, like that kind of thing. So some unique circumstances and trials and things for librarians to navigate right now, which I think is really interesting and really, I'm not going to say really great, but it presents a great opportunity for teacher entrepreneurs to help teachers and librarians like meet those needs, fill gaps and things like that. So I think that's really great. So talk to me about where your business is right now and then looking ahead into 2024, where you want it to be. So my baby business is indeed a baby. Like we're not even in the toddler phase going yet. I have 26 products, I think 26. And I know I've heard you say again and again to make product lines, but I'm so strapped with time between kids and working full time that it's really hard to find and carve out that time and 
actually make that happen. Like I have the start of some good product or I think they, they're they good product lines, but learning to find that balance and learning to juggle that has been a real challenge. I don't have a lot of marketing at all. Like one of my goals going forward is to try and do email marketing, but that's pretty overwhelming. And I know you have a previous podcast where you talked about like how to start email marketing. So that's definitely one that's I'm planning on revisiting in the new year, but as of right now, it's on the back burner. So I understand. I totally get where you're coming from when we're talking about like, yes, absolutely. Ideally, you'd be building out product lines. And we can talk about that a little bit more, maybe some ways to try to make that doable if it's possible in the coming year. But I'm assuming that the reason it's so challenging is because you're creating resources that you can use right now. Yeah. And so it doesn't necessarily fit to do the same type of thing every single week. For example, you're kind of changing it up a little bit, which I totally get. That is a challenge. It's a legitimate challenge. And for sure, like I just want to start by saying that creating resources that you can create and you can get listed is more important than following a set pattern and creating those product lines. So I totally get it. The next thing that you touched on was email marketing, which we will for sure talk about because you know I'm a lover of email marketing. So we've got these goals. We've got these challenges for meeting those needs. You also had mentioned something inside of your form about wanting to make sure that the visual aspect of your resources, like your product covers and previews and things like that, were doing your products justice and making sure that they were highlighting, visually appealing, but without looking like everybody else's right? Like that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So we definitely want to take a look at your store and we take a look at everybody's store regardless of where they started. But I think in the beginning, it's really nice. And and for anyone listening, just having somebody take a fresh set of eyes and look at your store. It doesn't have to be a professional. It doesn't have to be somebody that you've paid to do it. I would say like going into, for example, our free rebranded teacher community and asking people, hey, take a look at my store. What are some things that you notice? Now, to be clear, (laughs) before you do this and you open yourself up to criticism, just make sure that it's a good week. Like you haven't had like a bad week at school, (laughs) you know, you weren't, you didn't receive a bad evaluation or anything like that. Make sure you're in a good place mentally and you're ready to like hear some things, but I've seen so much great feedback that you can get from the teacher author community absolutely free, but we're going to take a look at your store together. And and obviously if you're listening on podcast, you're not going to be able to see her store. So I would encourage you to go. We've got this specific audit. It's on YouTube. So if you want to just go watch the audit, you can go watch the audit on YouTube. There's a link for that down in the description, but we'll come back and we'll recap this for you so that you can know what the main points were that we talked about when we looked at Rebecca's store. Okay, so let's go take a look at that store now. We're here with Rebecca from the Fox Reads and she's a new TPT seller. She's been selling for a little over six months and we're taking a look at some of her resources. We're gonna take a look at her store and these are quick audits. So these are not in-depth audits, but basically what I'm doing is I'm looking for red flags and maybe even some orange flags and giving TPT authors, some things that they can work on within their store that will help them meet their goals. And if you want to watch the full coaching call with Rebecca, I encourage you to check out the link inside of the description. You can watch this entire video, but let's take a look at your store. Okay. So one of the things that I like is you've got a great call to action banner here. Welcome. You've, you're giving them something to do to follow your store when they're here and you're giving them a reason to do it. I also think that this type of banner putting right here, like having fun in the library, this is kind of your store's motto, your brand motto. Mm-hmm. It's giving them information about who you are, the types of resources that you create. And I know in the very beginning, it can be really overwhelming to think about what to put in this banner, especially like what products do I highlight? What should I put here? You know, that kind of thing. And this is a really simple way to utilize that banner. If you're brand new, just having something to put there and it having a purpose, even if it's not like the quote unquote best purpose, right? Like ideally we would be highlighting a product line or a seasonal resource or something like that. But if all you can do is just get something up that tells visitors a little bit more about your store, incorporate your branding a little bit more, this is a great, great start. So I love that. So when we talked and you've got 26 products and when we're talking before about branding and wanting to make sure that your covers are aesthetically pleasing, they're standing out, they're eye-catching, but without looking 
looking like everybody else's, right? I would say, first of all, for a new seller, your covers look really good. They look really, really good. There are a couple of things that I would tweak. Number one, I actually really love your branding font. And I know that this is the same font, but I love the colors, how they alternate. I think it's really popping and eye-catching. Whereas I feel like this kind of just blends in and is a little bit harder to read. I can still read it, don't get me wrong. Like I'm not struggling too much, yeah. but I feel like this is easier to read. Okay. If it were me, I would stick with that same alternating colors that you have in your branding and I would use that on your covers. Okay. I would also say that while I love your scripty scrolly font that you have for branding, I don't love it on the covers. For ones like this where it's, you can make it really large like quiz number one, I can read that. But for ones like this one, it's really kind of difficult to read and I really kind of have to pause. I was gonna say that's something that I've kind of gone back and forth on and my husband has made that point, but I don't listen to him sometimes, so. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know right, neither do I. <laughs> so um, my husband actually told me the same thing whenever we first got married. He was like, you should pay somebody to do your covers for you. And I was highly offended, but he was right. <laughs> he was definitely right. And mine def mine looked way worse than yours. I can tell you that right now. Like I had, I had some issues going on with my covers. But with the scripty scrolly font, you wanna think about the fact that if somebody's coming across your product in search, which right now is gonna be the primary way that they come across your product because you're so new, you're not doing any marketing, so you're having to rely on that organic traffic that's coming from the TPT search engine, that they are scrolling. You know how we do when we're buyers. We're just scrolling real fast. So if I can't read it in half a second, it's probably not gonna get read. So that's one thing to keep in mind is maybe pick a font that's still nice, still bold. It can still be a little bit different from the font that you currently have or from this you know, top font, but just more legible, easier to read at a glance is what I would say, okay? Another thing that I'm noticing is you have quite a bit of variety within your temp cover templates. And this is normal, especially when you're first starting out and you're trying to figure out what looks best. And with each new product that you create, you're, you've learned more, you're trying something different, you know, that kind of thing. But I would say, try to come up with one template for say all of your bulletin boards it's not only gonna make it so much easier for you to create those covers and to create them faster because they're all following the exact same template, but it's gonna make it a little bit easier for the people to recognize what resources are yours. Okay. So for example, like these two look very similar, but like, let's see. I think I came across one down here, but maybe I didn't. Those are announcements. I would even put like the announcements, like you could even use a very similar one to your announcements. And maybe I didn't see one that was that different. Maybe these are pretty close, but I noticed like you've got this lesson and you've got a big bold font over the top of it, but then your other lessons don't look the same. So just kind of coming up with a format that's going to fit and streamline those just a little bit more. And even across, like you've got this game, but then you've got these gift tags, but then you've got announcements. There are ways that you can still make those look like they're all branded and all together. Like for example, you can utilize the same mock-up for these morning meeting slides that you're using for announcement slides. And that's just gonna kind of help build that branding for you and make everything a lot simpler for you. The only other thing that I would say is make sure that you're putting a value grab on each one of your resources. So first of all, I think it's great that you've got the grade level on here, but I cannot read it as is. I think a simple font change, maybe even a background change going like black on top of white, white on top of black or something like that would remedy this problem. And you would still be able to fit it within the same space or similar amount of space, but I would make that a little bit larger. And then I would also think about utilizing that value grab to justify the cost of your resource. So if I've got a censorship lesson, maybe I'm putting something in there like includes a full lesson plus activity, something like that. Okay. Full lesson plus 
independent practice. Maybe for my library forms, I'm putting something like X number of forms, something on there like scavenger hunt, X number of problems, something on there that tells the buyer what all they're getting in a very concise format. Okay. That way, when they're looking at your product and looking at the cost, because that's usually what we do, we scroll, we're looking at the cover, we're looking at something that catches our eye. And then immediately from that thing that catches our eye, we're going right over and we're looking at cost. So I want that cost to be justified before they ever look at it. And I think in today's economy, that's even more important than it's ever been before, especially with a lot of new sellers being on the market. Some of them are underpricing their resources, but also the TPT search engine is prioritizing resources that are getting higher conversion rates, that are getting more clicks and things like that. And a lot of times those resources are gonna be the less expensive resources. So we really wanna make sure on the onset, we're justifying that price and we're showcasing the value that our product has to offer rather than undercutting prices. Overall though, I would say that your covers look really good. Let's just take a quick look at your previews real quick. Seven, eight, nine, ten. So you've only got four grade levels tagged. Don't ask me why I'm a math teacher and I still have to count those, but I do. And genre, personality quiz. One thing that I would say is remember that with your keywords that when you're choosing keywords, you want to put your most important keywords at the very beginning. So just keep that in mind whenever you're titling these. Um, I'm not an expert on keywords for library resources, but just to note, because I do notice you have quite a few here. So whatever keywords you're really trying to stand out for, make sure you have that. But I do love that you're using middle and high school. You're putting those grade levels on there, which will help those secondary teachers find you. Okay, so we've got Personality quiz one, popular genres includes these genres, no prep, print and go, print version included, and then double-sided bookmarks. So one of the things that I would say is to put something like X number of slides or X number of questions and what the overall goal is. One of the things that we want to do is we want to guide them. So they're either looking for an experience or they're looking for convenience. Sometimes they're looking for both, but usually we're really trying to sell them on one or the other. In this case, I would say that you're trying to sell them on an experience. So we really want to walk them through what that experience is going to look like for the student and what the outcome is going to be. And I want to showcase that or tell the buyer that in my thumbnails and in my preview. So starting with something like students will do this to accomplish this, right? Students will answer X number of questions in order to blank. And then showing them things like, you know, choose between the digital version and the print version. When students are finished, they get these bookmarks with recommended books based on their preferences or something like that. Does that make sense? Yes. So just kind of walking them through what that experience is going to look like. And that's what one of the things that I ask myself every time I'm creating a resource, am I selling them on convenience or am I selling them on an experience? If I'm selling them on an experience, I need to sequentially walk them through what that experience is going to look like for their students and give them that outcome. Like here's what's going to happen. And this is going to result in this desired outcome right here, which is that students are going to get a recommended book list or students are going to get ideas for books or, you know, resources that they might be interested in. If I'm walking them through something that's going to be convenient for them. So for example, your morning slides, I think it was, let's see here. Oh, a censorship lesson could be that, but let's see, convenient for them might be a bulletin board. That's not really an experience. Library forms, that's definitely not an experience. That's definitely convenience. Then in that case, I'm really showcasing value and I'm highlighting highlighting aspects that are going to make it convenient for them. So I'm still wanting to state what you're getting and what your desired outcome is going to be with this. Volunteer form. What are you going to do with this volunteer form? How are you going to use it? How is it going to save you time? Don't have to answer all of those questions right there inside of the preview, but maybe picking one of those questions to answer. Same for like menu of library services help students find blank. Like what's the desired outcome for offering that menu of your library services? This just allows the buyer 
to move further into that process of either making a purchase or in this case, getting the free download. Because if I, the buyer kind of comes in, they're taking a look at it and then they decide whether or not to purchase. And in between those two steps, there's a critical turning point with having that buyer visualize what it would be like to use that product in their classroom. And if they can visualize using that product in their classroom, they're going to purchase or download it. If they cannot visualize using that product in their classroom, they're probably not gonna purchase it. So that's where we really want to focus on, here's what the resource is, and here's your desired outcome. When I give them that desired outcome, it just really helps give them that puzzle piece that can help them visualize utilizing that resource in your classroom. So just kind of doing that with your previews. And I think that that's going to make a really big difference in your conversion rates. But overall, aesthetically, your previews look really good. And that's just one little piece that I would add into it. And that's it. I can do that. Okay. Yeah. And that's really all I have for you. I think that those are two really basic things that you can work on with your covers and your previews. And as long as you've got those, I think that you're going to be doing really well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we took a look at your store, Rebecca. So excited. Your store looks great, especially for a brand new seller. And I encourage you, if you're listening to this on podcast, like go watch it. It's a short video. Go watch the video. There's a link down in the description. We talked about on your covers, really making sure that we're steering clear of scripty, scrolly fonts, things that you can't read in a nanosecond, right? Things that I'm going to have to stop and slow down and pay attention to. Also, in your particular case, we looked at sticking to some of your branding a little bit more closely with some of those alternating colors that you have because it did make it stand out. For me personally, it made it a little bit easier to read than using one of those really dark colors with the black outline. The next thing that we talked about on your covers was making sure that you had a value grab and really justifying that price. And for anyone listening, at this point, you've probably heard me say that on almost every single coaching call now. And this is always, you know, having a value grab has always been a really big deal, but I think now, especially in this economy, it's really, really important as teachers are taking a closer look at their bottom line, they're really looking at that price and considering that price point a little bit more heavily to make sure that we're justifying that price on the cover before they go over to look at it in the search. The next thing that we talked about was on your previews. We talked about the importance of really walking the teacher or walking the buyer through your product. We talked about deciding in the very beginning whether or not this is a product that offers an experience for students or teachers or offers convenience and the steps that we need to walk them through. If this is a product that is offering convenience, then I need to make sure I'm highlighting the features of that product Product that are going to be convenient for the teacher and telling them the desired outcome that they're going to get. So in your case, we said like, this is specific form for a librarian. Here's a volunteer form, not just telling them that it's a volunteer form, but then also telling them what that's going to help them accomplish with that volunteer form. And then we talked about with experiences, making sure that you're being really sequential when you're walking them through that product, what that experience is going to look like for either the student or the teacher from beginning to end, and also highlighting what the desired outcome is going to be for that experience. With both cases, making sure that they understand what desired outcome they're going to get with your product, that being a key piece or a key factor in getting that sale to convert or getting that product to convert into a sale because it's allowing that teacher or that buyer to visualize utilizing your resource, which takes them that much closer to clicking at to cart. Okay, so we talked about those few things. Now what I wanna do is I wanna talk about how to take that information and the goals that you have for 2024 and the hurdles that you have for 2024 and make everything kind of work together. So one of the things is when you're creating resources, if you're really focusing on like, hey, I'm gonna take a couple of weeks and I'm just gonna really focus on my templates for my product covers or my product previews and make sure that I've got those nailed down. I've got them solid. Then when I'm creating those resources and popping them out for my classroom or for my library students, then it's going to make the process of listing that much quicker, but it's also going to make it that much more effective because I'm not having to constantly like go back to the drawing board every single time 
And it's going to make that process of listing so much easier for you. The second thing that it's going to do is when you're doing that process of going through and making those templates, what I really want you to do is I want you to sit down and I want you to think, okay, what are the main resources that I am using in the library right now? What are the main resources that I'm using with my students? And we talked about before where you said, I know you said do product lines, focus on product lines, get it out there, but it's not really in the cards for me right now, which is totally fine. But I would say, let's pick four or five main things that I'm doing. And I'm going to stick with creating those four or five things. Everything else I'm going to purchase or I'm just not going to do it. And I know that that's really, really hard to say because it's like, well, I don't want to just not do it because then my students are missing out. Or I don't want to just not create it because then they're missing out. But when I really focus on saying, okay, I'm going to hone in and my students really love bulletin boards. They really love these lessons. Maybe they love the, the slides. Maybe I really need forms or maybe the scavenger hunts, like whatever. When I'm having to narrow down and pick, I promise your students are not going to get bored from doing scavenger hunts over and over. I know, I know, like, I mean, if that was the only thing you were doing, sure. But maybe I have scavenger hunts and I have this, like I have two things for students. I have two things or two or three things for me, right? So two or three resources for students, two or three resources for me. Okay. That's also two or three resources for other librarians, students, and two or three resources that are specifically for those other librarians. And when I'm doing that. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm only going to make templates for these items. And these are going to be the ones that I focus on. I'm not going to be able to churn those individual products out like super quickly, right? Because I can't just go, okay, all the scavenger hunts done, but I'm still going to have a method for how I'm adding those resources to my store. So I'm still going to be able to get those product lines completed faster because I'm not making as many things, just that not making sense. as many things. Okay. Yeah. So I would choose those templates, create those templates, stick to creating those specific products, and maybe in the process, choose one of those products that you're like, okay, this particular product line, let's just say it's scavenger hunts for students. Let's just say it's that, right? I'm only going to make eight of these, or I'm only going to make 10 of these before I bundle them. And here are the ones that I'm going to make. I would say that you don't have to do this for every single product line or every single one of the templates that you're creating, but just starting with doing it for one will allow you to maybe knock those out a little bit faster during your down seasons. And I'm putting that in quotation marks because there's really not a lot of downtime. But like if you have a couple of days during fall break, or if you have a couple of days during, you know, holiday break, winter break, or a day off somewhere, like you have one of those magical unicorn days where <laughs> your kids are in daycare or your kids are in school, but you are not because they're in another district, which may not apply to you, but I know it happens to some people every now and then, or maybe their dad is like taking them to the park one day or something like that. You already have a plan for that product that you can create that's part of that product line that you've already laid out. And so maybe that would give you something to kind of work on and maybe get one of those done. But we're not going to sweat trying to wrap up those bundles super quickly. We're just going to have a goal of maybe having them wrapped up by the end of the year. So maybe by the end of the year, I've got all of those morning slides done. Maybe by the end of the year, I've got all of those forms done something like that. I've got a couple of those product lines that are ready to go for next year. So that's what I would say to kind of help streamline that piece of it. On the email marketing, this one's kind of tricky yeah. because you're still building your store. So I'm going to give you two options okay. because I know people say it's never too soon to start building your email list. It's never too early to start, but sometimes starting too early can be incredibly overwhelming and it's and, and not worth it. I am team. If you have the extra time to create an opt-in, add it to your products, build your landing page, do all of that and just collect emails and write an email every couple of weeks, then by all means, go for it. Otherwise, I would personally wait until you have the time to participate in a collaborative event with other librarians or other people inside of your niche. And my reasoning behind that is you have to consistently market in order to get results from your email list. 
if I don't have the time to consistently market, then it's not really gonna be worth it to me. But also, if I'm making the time to consistently market, I actually wanna get a return on my investment. I don't wanna feel the burden to send an email out to 10 people, 80 people, like even 100 people, I don't really wanna feel the burden to do that. Because in general, you're gonna make about 10 cents per lead per month. So if I have 100 people on my list, I can make $10 a month. Writing four emails a month is gonna take me at least an hour. So I'm working for $10 an hour and that's yeah. working very quickly, right? So I hate to say, I know some people are gonna be like, it's still worth your time. You're still building for like, but not worth my time. To be honest with you, it's not worth my time. So that's where having that collab piece come in where even if I can get four, 500, 800, maybe even a thousand people on my email list, even if it's just 500 people, I'm then working for $50 an hour, which comes a lot closer to where I want to be for my time. And so it kind of starts to make that investment worth it for me. And I was actually talking about this with RTA members this month. They were like, oh, there were several people in there who were saying, I hate email marketing. I hate email marketing. I hate email marketing. And I said, wait a second, are you making money with email marketing? And they said, no. And I said, well, that's why you hate it. Like nobody, nobody wants to do things that's not making them money. Like no one wants to do it. So I would say, if you have the extra time and you want to go ahead and start collecting emails and you're okay with putting the labor into it and not getting anything back for a little while, by all means, go ahead and do it. Never too early to start collecting in that case. But if you're like, no, I'm limited on my time. I want to make sure that I'm getting a return on my investment, then I would say, wait till this summer where you can organize a collaborative event with other librarians or wait till you have the time to go ahead and do that and then make the jump on it and go full force. Yeah, yeah I like that because it's super overwhelming and just the idea of, oh my gosh, how am I going to fit in one more thing at this point is a lot on my plate. Yes, it, it is. It really is. And it's a lot like in the beginning, it's a lot, especially when you're like, I have no choice but to create products, right? So I talk about seasons a lot where there's a season for product creation and maybe we spend several months creating resources and then we pause and we focus on something else for a little bit. In the beginning, that season for product creation is very long because you have to have resources in your store. Like you have to, or you're not gonna make any money, right? But still keep in mind that you can bust your behind creating resources for the next several months and then take a month off in the summer to focus on doing something else. And like take okay. product creation off your plate and just be like, I'm not going to do that. Just going to focus on this one thing. Yeah, that makes sense. That's it. Sounds hopeful. <laughs> like, yes. Eventually, at some point, I'd like to get to that spot where it's just okay. I can take a break. Yeah, absolutely. And at fifty products, Rebecca, you can take a break. Like you can do that okay. at fifty products for sure. And then just tell yourself like I'm going to do fifty products, and then I'm going to do twenty products and take another break, and then I'm going to get to a hundred products, and I'm going to take a break. Like build them in and make sure you're still taking breaks. But yeah, for sure. In the beginning, it's a lot lengthier for product creation. And then it's building the, like you said, building the templates, taking the time to do that. I'm doing it all from scratch. And I did not realize how time consuming that was because like everybody says, you build it for your classroom and that's one thing, but then to make it like go in line with copyright and make sure that it looks visually pleasing to lots of people and as opposed to just yourself and making sure all the little things are correct. It's very time consuming. So it is. It's good. It really is. But you've gotten the big pieces out of the way. Like you've got to start for all of these incredible product lines. So hopefully it'll be a little bit faster moving forward. Yeah. It is, has gotten like, oh my gosh, night and day the amount of quickness that I can do it now. It still takes time, but it's, I feel way more confident. I feel like I'm slowly getting the hang of it. Yeah, so. absolutely. Awesome. Do you have any other questions for me? No, not really. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure as soon as we hang up, I'll come up with a million. <laughs> I hear you. Well, we've covered a lot of information today. So thank you so much for being here. Where can listeners find you if they want to connect with you? So I'm on Instagram at the.fox.reads. Or you can send me a message at Rebecca A. Fox at gmail.com. I love it. Well, thanks so much for being here, Rebecca. You have a great rest of your week. Thanks, you too. Thanks for all your uh -huh. help. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for being here, you guys. I put out weekly content for teacher entrepreneurs. We have lots of great coaching call videos in the library, so make sure you catch up on those. I'm going to see you guys right back here next week.